Welcome to our Appalachia. My name is Phil Kahn. I'm your host for this show, and we have a very interesting topic today. Might have some practical use for you because we're going to talk about hunting raccoons, or coons is the easier way to say it, and varmints. And I guess we'll start off by finding out the difference between the two for those of you who don't know about the breadth of raccoon hunting in the country. Today we have a real specialist on this subject, a friend of mine named Sid Stewart, and most of you will know Sid as being from Morgan County, but Sid got started with a large family years before that in Knott County. Sid and I are both members of families with 12 children, so we've had a lot of fun today talking about growing up in a large family. Sid went to Moorhead State University, graduated from Moorhead in 61, and we're really tickled, Sid, that you have a daughter here now, Cindy, and she's keeping the family tradition for Moorhead right. State alive. But I have found out over the years that Sid has a variety of interests. He's involved in raising draft horses right now. He's been involved in the construction industry, in coal mining, but he also has a lifelong interest in hunting in this part of the country. And right now, I guess he's heavier into hunting coons and raising coon dogs, coon hounds, than anything else. But I think we're going to start off, Sid, by taking you all the way back to your boyhood. And I'd like for you to tell me about your interest in hunting as a youngster in Knott County. What types of critters <coughs> did you hunt, and how did you hunt them years ago? Phil, we, as a boy in Knott County, we hunted everything that either from had fur or feathers. <laughs> right. And that included the possum and the polecat or the skunk. There were very few coon, so we, we didn't have any real coon dogs. Right. This is in Knott County. We, that was in Knott County, in Hindman, Kentucky. But we did hunt the possum at night, and during the daytime we hunted the groundhog. Right. And uh, we didn't hunt them as they were hunted today with a rifle, pretty much. We took dogs, little mountain feist dogs, and they tracked them into our burrow in the ground. We then we took a shovel <clears throat> and a hole and we dug them out. The, the main event in the groundhog hunt was digging into where the groundhog become visible to the dog. Right. And then they'd have a big fight. Right. Of course, all the kids enjoyed the fight. Right. And uh, my grandmother's brother, a fellow by the name of Trav Combs, was a great mountain hunter. Right. And I always uh, gave credit to my own hunting uh, desires to, uh, from uh, being associated with, with my great uncle. He had uh, hounds all his life, and since I've been five or six or seven year old, I've always had hounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I asked an inborn love for right. a dog. Now, you're talking about hunting groundhogs. You never did call groundhogs woodchucks, I don't guess. I never heard the word <laughs> field probably until I came right. to the <laughs> Well, same with me. I grew up in East <laughs> Tennessee, and to me, a groundhog was a groundhog. But I guess in Knott County, you not only hunted groundhogs for sport, but you made some use of groundhog yeah. hides. The groundhog you? hide is probably the toughest hide any animal in the mountains has. And there's a little mountain process, I, I suppose, of making life from ashes, from wood ash. Right. And you soak the groundhog hide in the, in the wood ash, right. and the hair comes off. Right. Leaves the hide fairly clean, and, and us mountain folks used to make shoestrings and, and boot laces banjo heads and any any uh, thing that required a r extremely stout type of string we used groundhogs right string for it. right now you mentioned a couple of dogs that are of interest to me we're going to talk about coon hounds later but you mentioned a feist dog as a good dog for hunting groundhogs and you mentioned a cur yeah to me the term cur is almost synonymous with the term mongrel but you were telling me earlier that a cur dog has actually become a breed of dog in some areas. Uh, the cur dog really, feel has always been a separate breed of dog. I see. Uh, I suppose they were mixed up, you know, uh, confused with mongrels because they're different colors. Mm -hmm. Their cur, cur dogs are red and black and, and uh, brennel and so forth, but they, there is a distinct breed of cur dog. And the thing that separates them from a hound as far as hunting purposes is concerned is the fact that they do not open or give voice on a trail. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they track the game up solid, <clears throat> and only when it goes in a hole or a tree, then they bark. And, and now, signal. cur dogs are used to hunt what type of animals? Uh, at that time, cur dogs were, were the predominant dog in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And they, were, they not only used uh, to hunt possums and groundhog and coon, but they were used as stock dogs. And, and a lot of them were big Big square-headed right. yellow dogs, right? That's right. They were the old yellow mountain curs. And it uh, was very characteristic of the mountains. People true, used curs true. in mountain hunting uh, back when you were They're there. almost extinct, in my opinion. Right. Uh, 
uh, because they're not a real sporting dog. The cur dog is a dog that, hey, if you're hunting for meat or pelts, you probably would it's want to use a cur dog. It's a no-nonsense dog. You really That's want right. something to do That's when right. you're going with a cur dog. Uh, but the cur dog is to be respected. And, right. uh, you know, he served the mountain people well. He was a watchdog at night. Right. He'd help get the cattle. He could catch right. a hog in the field and hold him by the ear. And he could treat you a possum at night and hold your groundhog in the daytime. Really an all-purpose, no-nonsense dog. That's true. Well, I've heard of cur dogs all my life. I know there's even a movie lately about a dog they called Old Yeller. I That's guess true. Old Yeller looked pretty much like he was. Uh, he was a cur dog. Yeah. I see. I saw the movie. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'd love to find a, uh, what I felt was a purebred cur dog. Because they were good hunters, but Excellent. they went Excellent. for the game and intended to have a kill before uh, it was all over. That's right. They, they weren't, they were not necessarily a sporting dog. Right. They didn't give voice on a trail. And, right. But uh, they were, they were a dog to be admired and, and uh, would mean more to the mountain Appalachian people than any hound that right. uh, probably ever bred. Now, I introduced this program today as hunting raccoons and varmints, so I'm going to give you a hard time. I've heard that <laughs> coon hunters don't like to have a coon referred to as a varmint. No. Is there any difference uh, in your mind between uh, varmint hunting and hunting certain animals like raccoons? Well, I suppose that... Uh, you know, to be an expert away from home, it, the varmint <clears throat> and the game animal is, is differentiated in between it, what you're hunting. Mm -hmm. uh, a raccoon to me is the most sporting animal there is, probably. Right. In some other states, especially southern states where the population is heavy, uh, they're a nuisance, so there's no law that right. regulates them, and they're referred to as varmints. Right. Uh, so a varmint really is a pest, and ordinarily it's not protected by game laws. That's, uh, generally that's Whereas true. Whereas a game animal or a sporting animal is something that has a season. Yes, that's true. And there's a conscious effort on the part of law enforcement officials that's to true. protect uh -huh. the population. Uh, for example, a groundhog is not a game animal, as far as I know in any state. And in it's other legal. words, you can shoot a raccoon or uh, a groundhog. Uh, certain times of year, but you can shoot a raccoon only uh, in season. In season. Uh -huh, that's true. Okay. That's generally the basic difference, I think. Right. You say some states, though, yes, with so there a heavy are, population of raccoons. Uh, for example, in South Carolina, the coon population are so thick due to the abundant food on the you know, right. seacoast right. and the swampy area that about every three to four years they have a disease known as distemper, right. and, they, and they all die. Mm -hmm. But within two or three years, they, the population regains to the proportions mm -hmm. that every coon that has distemper gives it to every other coon he sees, and they all well, they, die. So, uh, now, distemper, what type of disease is that? That How is it a, it's a respiratory coons. disease that's okay. common to dogs and uh, cats and raccoons. Right. And, uh, most small animals. Uh, you made reference to the diet of raccoons. Now, it amazes me that raccoons seem to be along waterways. I know if you really want to see lots of raccoons down in Florida where they have a lot of water, they seem to have a lot of raccoons. And I notice in this country, along major waterways like the Licking River or the Kentucky River, you find a lot of raccoons. You don't find as many raccoons maybe in back country. And you indicated that even in Knott County, which doesn't have a major river, yeah. There yes. weren't that many raccoons when you were a boy. That's true. I, I think that the population of raccoon is directly related to the food that's available mm -hmm. and along waterways, and especially in the southern part of the United States where, you know, crayfish and that sort of thing are available winter and summer. Uh, however, it do somewhat to seasons also. Right. Uh, in the fall and early winter, even coons that uh, are in valleys, like Licking River Valley, mm -hmm. they revert to the hillside and eat acorns. I see. And uh, so it, it depends on, on the season, but generally raccoons are associated mm -hmm. with water. Now you've mentioned crayfish, or what we used to call crawdads, yeah. and you mentioned acorns. What are some of the other foods that raccoons uh, prefer? During the winter months in, in this area, uh, acorns and uh, beech nuts, uh, perhaps you know a root or so that mm -hmm. uh, is about the only available food. Now they, uh, uh, they're able to turn over rocks, you know, mm -hmm. proportion to their size, and they find all sorts of little salamanders and uh, what we call, in the mountains, we call water dogs, and right. they, they eat those. And of course, uh, in the spring, in the early summer, they eat berries, primarily mm -hmm. blackberries. But uh, they're actually omnivorous then. They eat a wide variety that's right. of things. Uh, they, they also eat uh, animals to the extent of catching a f birds and robbing a bird's nest and eating, mm -hmm. eating eggs. Are they like a possum, though, in that they're scavengers? Will they eat no, they dead don't, meat? Uh, no, they don't. Uh, I've never known a raccoon. I've never heard anyone that would probably know say that a raccoon would eat anything that was dead. They, they kill their own meat. I see. And, uh, of course, a possum will eat anything that he finds that's right, already killed. Right. Even uh, there are cannibals, cannibalistic right. possums are. Well, you know, that interests me because I've heard of more folks in my life eating groundhogs 
and possums than I have of eating raccoons. Now, a fella from near the Brakes area of Virginia and Kentucky told me that wasn't true where he grew up. Said they'd eat a raccoon because it was thought to be clean and they wouldn't touch possums and they wouldn't touch groundhogs. Uh, do people eat raccoons to this day? Yeah, people uh, in Morgan County, uh, it's not a regular diet, but uh, we do eat raccoons. I've eaten raccoons. In fact, I enjoy them. They're pretty much <coughs> like beef, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit stringy. Whereas uh, I, I would assume the reason, Phil, that people can't eat a possum right. is because of his physical appearance. Right. You know, his tail doesn't have any hair on it, <laughs> and his, right. his feet are almost like little human hands. Right. In fact, they're a uh, different color than uh, the rest of his body. and. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, perhaps I can mention also, he, his nose is usually pretty moist. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> it's just not a very appetizing dish. Right, a even pretty though, primitive looking animal. Even though I have seen uh, possum cooked and, and on the table, and it's a beautiful meat, right. it, it looks like domestic, d domestic rabbit. It's, mm -hmm. In fact, it's snow white. Whereas a groundhog is a real dark uh, bluish right. meat. But people eat groundhogs uh, in this area yeah, quite more than they do possum, uh -huh. and certainly more than they do coons. They're uh, totally vegetarian for us, I know, and that seems to make it easier for uh, right. people to... Well, tell me about possums, as long as we've mentioned possums. Did people hunt possums with dogs when you were a boy? Yes. <clears throat> they used the cur dog. Who, right. Who, and when he smelled the track, you know, the sign or the scent that the possum leaves on the ground, of course, he doesn't voice now. He doesn't mm -hmm. bark. And he trails the possum up, and he probably doesn't... The possum doesn't know he's even being trailed. Mm -hmm. So he can tree him. <clears throat> right. Now, the purpose of that is so he won't go in the ground and right. a, a hole in the ground, so we won't have to dig him out. The possum was the primary sport of all teenage <coughs> mountain hunters when possum I grew up. Right. Yeah, we didn't have uh, we didn't have very many raccoons, or we didn't have the dogs that were able to treat them. One or the other, I'm not sure. Well, every time I run upon a possum, it seems to be an awfully slow-moving animal to me. Can they move rather fast when you're chasing uh, them, or are they a little slower? Well, no, they they really can't move much faster than you see one run across the, right. the highway in right. front of your car, but. Uh, <coughs> They can climb real well, and they don't hesitate to do that. And then, of course, uh, a possum will uh, play possum, you right. know, if you know what a right. soul or uh, right. pretend to be dead. They're actually and easier to run down than many Yes, game that's right. And, and that's one of their basic defenses is just mm -hmm. to pretend that they're dead. And, but that doesn't, uh, a dog instinctively knows when he's dead and when he's not. Right. So it doesn't really give him any defense. Doesn't help much. That's right. right. <laughs> well, what about polecats? I'm sure you had never eaten polecat. I tell you, if anyone <laughs> slipped a polecat into a varmint dinner, I'd want to know about it. Uh, but I guess polecats, skunks, are the nemesis of coon hunters, maybe even fox hunters, because <laughs> dogs will take out after a skunk from time that's to time. That's true. They love to run a skunk. I see. And do they generally let up as soon as a skunk decides to give its famous scent? They usually, no, they usually don't uh, let up until they catch the skunk. And then, and then, of course, it's quite evident when a dog comes back to you, it's what he's been but doing. But when the air is full of the odor of a skunk, a uh, dog Some, will keep coming. Yeah. Some dogs get physically sick mm -hmm. uh, when, they, when they're, uh, you know, in close contact with a skunk. Some don't. Mm -hmm. Some will kill one and then kill another one. Uh, I'll tell you something that's peculiar to the skunk, and when one goes in a hole in the right. ground, and if you know you're not sure what's in there, if he hadn't really been thoroughly disturbed, he won't, you know, he won't spray his scent, mm -hmm. but he will pat his feet I'll on see. the ground in the burrow, right? And uh, he sounds you've probably heard a rabbit thump mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. in the cage, so that's you can find out what's in there if you hold your ear down there and, and disturb him a little bit. And he'll you can recognize a skunk right. thumping, even though you don't see. And you're inclined to head on out. And That's for correct. More promising game. You just right. don't do any digging in that hole. Right, right. Why in the world is a skunk called a polecat? Do you have any idea? Have you ever heard any old timers? Really, feel I, I don't know. But my grandfather, who was quite a mountaineer, uh, was asked that question once, and he told me he asked me, "Son, have you ever caught a skunk in a?" trap? And I said, no. He said, well, when you do, you'll find out what it is. And the real reason, Phil, I think, is when you trap a skunk in a steel trap, you have to cut a pole 10 or 15 feet long and get him on the end of the stick <laughs> and take him to the stream and right, drown him right, because there's no right. other way to kill him without getting sprayed. Right. And it is an effort, a genuine effort, to get skunk scent out of a dog's fur oh, yes. or uh, out of clothing or anything else. Uh, that is, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, tomato juice is one remedy, and there's some other remedies right. that work fairly right. well. Well, let's talk about your favorite love here. I don't want to spend all the time talking about varmints. We'll talk about uh, what you consider to be the most honorable sport of all, <laughs> and that's well put. hunting coons with coon dogs. And you that's true. breed and raise your own dogs, I take it. Yes, sir, I do, Phil. Let me introduce our audience to a little book here. 
This is a book written by Sid Stewart called The Competition Hound. Okay, and I've noticed that in the illustrations, you will have a lot of your favorite hounds and you have a lot of tales of experiences you've had in training hounds. What caused you to write this book? Do you feel it serves a purpose that was going unmet? Phil, I, I hope it really will. Uh, during the past 20 years, there have been five hounds that's come from my kennels that have won national championships. I see. It's probably not a record, but it's a, you know, it's a fairly good accomplishment. And I hunt with lots of, especially youngsters, mm -hmm. that have young hounds, and I see so many things that they do wrong. And I felt that if I could just write a, sort of a training manual, an instructional manual in simple terms as to what is good and what's bad in training hounds, that it would help someone. And frankly, to my surprise, it's been selling rather well. Right. And this is actually a guide then to properly training That's true. coon hounds. That's basically what it is. Right. So give us some of the basic things you're after, number one, in breeding a good coon hound. Okay. The, <clears throat> the old timer or mountaineer's theory was breed only the best of the best and kill all the rest. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's how we really got to have hounds that uh, have enough instinct to want a tree game. Mm -hmm. uh, but the basic, uh, first basic step in, in uh, selecting a coon hound is to go to someone who, you know, you feel has some knowledge and, and select a quality pup. Mm -hmm. And of course, I've outlined in the book the health procedures, a lot of worming problems and distemper and hepatitis mm -hmm. and leptospirosis, those diseases. But once you get him uh, up to about five or six months old, generally you have another dog, an older trained dog, and you start this young hound hunting by taking him with an older dog. But now, before we get right into the training, are there certain breeds that have been developed there are coon uh, hounds, or can almost any hound take the coon hunt? There, are, no, a foxhound, for example, absolutely won't run a raccoon. Totally different thing. He just won't tree. Hound, coon yeah, hound. he just won't tree. There's nothing you can do to him to make him tree. And you mean this is in his genetic makeup? That's true. Oh yes. Oh yes. It's in his breeding. Right. Uh, a coon hound, however, to our coon hunters' dismay, will run a fox. Mm -hmm. But uh, a foxhound just won't tree a coon. Right. Uh, there are six basic different breeds of coon hounds. I see. Uh, some of them are much older. The older breeds that uh, typical to mountaineers were the black and tan and a blue tick mm -hmm. and the red bone hounds. A blue tick hound in and a red bone hound, those are coon hounds? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I don't know my breeds too well <laughs> and I can't tell a fox hound from a coon hound. Probably the most popular dog today is a walker dog called a treeing walker dog. Mm -hmm. The walker dog was originally developed in England. I so see. we didn't really breed our own dogs. We right. sort of imported them. But they are more akin to the cur dog. As a matter of fact, personally, I feel like that they have a cross into the cur dog. Mm -hmm. They're a highly aggressive dog. Mm -hmm. The walker dogs are highly competitive. And you told me that a coon hound really has to be more aggressive than a fox hound, in your way of thinking. Generally, a fox hound does ha has no desire to kill an animal. Mm -hmm. If they chase a fox down or catch him in a situation where he can't escape, they won't kill him. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, they don't even attempt to bite him or mm -hmm. they just, well, they lose interest. When the chase mm -hmm. is over, a fox hound lose interest. Right. A coon hound is a, uh, they're basically a killer dog. Mm -hmm. And that's why they chase the coon and mm -hmm. desire to kill him. And most coon hunts do end in shooting a coon, at least in season. Unfortunately, Phil, that's true. Right. I understand that coon pelts are worth quite a bit now. Uh, last year, prime coon pelts were bringing $35 a piece. Okay, so there's really and some monetary incentive. Uh, unfortunately, for there is. Coon yeah. pelts. Most, most coon hunters, uh, you know, try to use their influence to uh, reduce <laughs> the price of coon pelts, but it doesn't. Uh, but a lot of your most avid coon hunters then are interested in building up the coon population, yes. so they oh, don't yes. bother to shoot them. And I guess a lot of people that shoot coons really aren't into coon hunting to the extent you would be. Uh, well, <clears throat> there are some more or less commercial coon it hunters that, uh, I see. that uh, <clears throat> I don't know if it's illegal or not, but they use a spotlight and a gun at night mm -hmm. in the vicinity of cornfields and don't even use a dog. Right. You know, they don't pretend to be any sport uh, They're, they're uh, after at pelts. All. Right. They're after pelts and money on well, Let's go back to training very briefly because I assume that one of the biggest problems you have in training a coon hound is get him onto a coon scent and get him to leave everything else alone. <laughs> now, will a coon hound instinctively go for anything that breathes? A young coon hound, even though I've heard different stories from people that were promoting different breeds, right. but there were dogs that ran coon only. In my lifetime, I've never seen one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a young coon hound that's full of life and healthy will uh, chase a deer or fox or possum right. or skunk, uh, whatever. And even in the mountains of Kentucky, when I have my dog broke from running fox or deer, I can take him out to Oklahoma 
and he'll find some different uh, some different game that's made of dog wrong. Wrong. <laughs> So it's almost impossible to have a dog totally you, wrong. You actually have to break a hound, though, almost animal by animal from chasing other yes, things? Yes, individually. So, so it's really a process of eliminating animals that's true. rather than getting them to zero in on uh, a coon. The basic training process is sort of a reward and punishment, <clears throat> you know, deal. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, when he chases a coon up a tree and he catches that, then you pet him, and, and he understands mm -hmm. that, believe it or not. And mm -hmm. when he chases an opossum, you catch the dog and you whip him a little bit. Right. And so he, <clears throat> he makes a relationship right. fairly soon. You do try to familiarize him, though, with a coon scent. Oh, yes. That's one reason, of course, a coon <clears throat> hunter would need to shake a coon out of a tree That's or shoot true. a coon because I guess a part of the reward process yep. is to show a hound that it's That's true. It's grabbed uh, a hold of what it should. It's almost impossible to break a hound from off game mm -hmm. without catching coon from him during the process. Right. Because he has to have that association. Right. But the, you're right. The most difficult <clears throat> the most difficult problem there is in training a coon hound is to keep him from running fox mm -hmm. near. And uh, when he's a mile and a half away from you in the woods there's not much you can do about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Well, will a coon automatically go for a tree now, or is a part of the craft of a dog to keep them from going into a burrow and to get them in no. the tree instead? No, <clears throat> a coon, at different seasons of the year, they run different, uh, you know, they, they have different, Right. Uh, it seems sometimes that a coon almost enjoys the chase. I see. They, uh, <clears throat> they'll go to the river and they'll swim across and they'll go into drift and out. Mm -hmm. and they'll climb up a tree and then they'll jump out into the river so the hound can't make connection when the, once mm -hmm. the scent leaves the tree. So they're a crafty animal and, and quite, uh, mm -hmm. quite sporty to hunt them. But, uh, no, they're free to go wherever they, you know, mm -hmm. whether they have time to go. Right. And uh, about half the coons go up a tree on the, on the outside where you can see them. About mm -hmm. half probably go in a hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. or, or now, do you keep pursuing a coon if it holds up? I mean, do you no. try to dig it out or you let no, it? No, you, that's where the, the honey is. It's over. Right. That's over. Right, yeah. okay. But you say a coon is very wily. I don't guess you'd use this term to a coon hunter, <laughs> but foxy and does try to evade hunters and sometimes yes. will lead dogs on and on. Oh, yes. Uh, a farm where there's been recent bulldozing work, uh, they will work themselves in and out of the, of the you know, the wood and the dirt. Right. And, and, and very often, the hound just simply can't follow the trail any mm -hmm. further. Are there other ways they avoid dogs? Oh, do they do any kind of backtracking or go through water or things to... Well, of course, they use the water right. you know, okay. quite a bit. They do a lot of swimming. But... Uh, they're probably not as wild, to use your term, as a fox in that sense. Right. Uh, I've never known a coon to really backtrack right. uh, purposely. Right. You were telling me something earlier, though, that was <clears> fascinating <throat> to me. I asked you if possums really like persimmons, like <laughs> the stories have <laughs> <of> it. <laughs> and you told me they not only like persimmons, but that the scent of persimmons and even the scent of the little berries, I guess seed pods, on red cedar can throw dogs off. Is That's that right. True? Somehow or other, it, it has effect on the scent, mm -hmm. scent pads on a, on a coon's mm -hmm. foot. And once he's eaten persimmons and gotten thoroughly, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, got them on himself, when he leaves the tree, <clears throat> the hound can no longer smell his sign until he's traveled, you know, maybe right. half a mile or right. something. And it, it's highly confusing to So if a coon's been eating persimmons all day, he's got a little better chance. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. right. He right. sure has. You know, I've often heard that raccoons are very clean animals, and the reason they're said to be clean is because folks will say, well, look, a coon will wash everything it eats. And I have observed, as most people have, a raccoon taking food and dipping it in water. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that that doesn't have a whole lot to do with cleanliness because I've seen them dip garbage in water. <laughs> Why do coons put food in water? As well as, as I've been able to understand, Phil, the real biological reason is the fact that they have numerous nerve endings mm -hmm. in, their, in their toes or their fingers. And when they moisten those, it has a tendency to make them more sensitive. Right. And uh, <clears throat> I assume that's probably true. Right, right. Well, you know, a lot of folks kind of view coon hunting as what you might call a poor man's sport, but you've kind of enlightened me in that regard. I guess I should show the audience here a very attractive magazine called The American Cooner. As a matter of fact, that's a dollar and a half for starts, and that is a monthly magazine, I take it, uh -huh. and deals with coon hunting nationwide. But I am amazed in flipping through this book because I not only find a long list of paraphernalia that you can use in coon hunting, I find that a good coon hound is certainly cost prohibitive where I'm concerned. And I was amazed here to find that coon hounds run $1,000, $2,000, $3,000. Naturally, people hunt coons who don't have that caliber of dog, but why are coon hounds so expensive? <coughs> there is a, <coughs> excuse me, a national championship held each year 
in this country, and the winner is automatically worth about forty or fifty thousand dollars. That's I'll probably be. one incentive. Now that's a champion hound. Yeah, that's a national champion hound. Right. So that's probably one of the monetary incentives, other than you know, people that have dogs that they use for uh, breeding purposes, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the breeding fee is probably two to three hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So. Those dogs that win some of those national hunts are valuable breeding right. animals. Uh, now, you told me that a coon hound is really more highly trained and therefore more expensive than a fox hound. Well, I'm sure there are numerous fox hunters. That <laughs> they, they, we'll that, give them equal time <laughs> later. But <laughs> I wouldn't agree with that. Right, right. But a coon hound does more things than a fox hound does. Right. A fox hound finds the scent of a fox in the woods, mm -hmm. and he's supposed to chase it until a fox goes into a hole or into right. his den. While a coon hound has got to find the scent of a <clears throat> raccoon, and he chase it up a tree and then stay at the tree for hours mm -hmm. sometimes, especially if his owner's lost in the woods right. and announce by his barking where he is. Right. So uh, I, I feel that that's probably requiring a little bit more mm -hmm. from the dog than the fox hunter, and even though I, I love the fox hunter right. too. Tell me very quickly, I'm going to give you a loaded question. We don't have much time, okay. but why is it that coon <coughs> hunters have a lot of trouble with trappers? I've talked to a lot of coon hunters who say that what's ruining coon hunting in this country is all these dang trappers cleaning out all of our game. Well, of course, as a boy, I trapped, Phil, so I, I wouldn't want to be too hard on the trappers, but trapping a coon hide is a commercial kind of uh, endeavor rather than, in my opinion, a sport. Uh, mm -hmm. I really wouldn't consider trapping a sport due to the cruelty that's dealt to the animal that's caught in a mm -hmm. steel trap. But the big reason that coon hunters dislike trappers is, number one, the dogs get caught in a trap chasing a coon at night along right. the riverbank, and number two is it destroys a coon population. Right. And uh, to lose a good hound and a trap is a, is a dreadful thing. Right. Well, I hate we're going to have to wrap it up, Sid. It's been a fascinating discussion, and I want to continue this discussion with you some other time, but right now I want to welcome Sid Stewart again to the campus and certainly to our program, Our Appalachia. <clears throat> it's been a very fascinating topic, and I want our audience to join us again next week as we share with you another discussion that has to do with the culture and the heritage of the region around us. Thanks Thank a whole Phil. lot. Thank you, Phil.